Jonathan Abrams is the book writer of The Heart of Rock and Roll on Broadway. I'm David Buchanan with Gold Derby. Jonathan, um, I feel like the book for this show is so original and clever because you take all of this pre-existing music by Huey Lewis and the News and incorporate it into a really fun and clever and original story. What was the kernel of the inspiration for the idea? What Was there a particular song or moment from the catalog that said, this is going to kind of launch into this, you know, unique story? Well, thank you for saying that. Uh, we've worked very hard on it. And I say we, it's very much a collaborative effort. But in terms of the kernel that sparked the story, I wrote all the lyrics to his songs down, especially the hits, and I pasted them up on my wall. And I looked for just key words and ideas and images, almost like a storyboard, as you would a movie, which is my background. And the heart of rock and roll as a title and as an anchor, it was, was very, very helpful. I don't want to give too much away, but the notion of a song that lays out in its lyrics every major city in America, almost as if to suggest a tour of some kind felt like, okay, that's, that's a decent place to begin. And then hip to be square sort of popped up and I said, okay, well, what, what's the connective, the line between hip to be square and the heart of rock and roll is still beating. And that point A to B was really the, okay, I think I know what I'm gonna do here globally. Yeah, that's, that's great. And you kind of answered the question, but I just wanna ask you more about it because yeah. um, there are so many songs that Huey Lewis and the News have written. Um, so how much did you have full say over what songs would be included? How much did Huey and, and the band want to, you know, emphasize what songs they wanted in? Because obviously when you have, you're working with dozens of songs in this show, you know, to kind of put them all into a narrative must be incredibly challenging. So how involved were you in, you know, kind of having the final say on what to include and, and what not? It was incredibly challenging. Huey was very gracious. And if I recall, never demanded that any song be used, although it sort of goes without saying that there are some that you need to use or else the audience would be left disappointed. However, as a for instance, you know, Heart and Soul was a big hit for Huey Lewis. I think it peaked at maybe number six or something. And we just, we tried, but we could never find a way to use that song that felt organic to the story we were telling. And so we didn't use it. And Huey said, I completely understand. Conversely, songs like The Only One, You Crack Me Up, Don't Make Me Do It, were ones where when I initially previewed that with Huey, he was like, you don't want to use that. It wasn't a hit. And I said, well, but the lyrics are really good. You underestimate yourself, Huey Lewis. And those songs, I think, end up being especially The Only One, some of the most powerful moments in the show. Another one was Hit Me Like a Hammer, which, you know, was a song that I think it maybe peaked at number 18, like it charted. It was a single. Mutt Lang, the famous songwriter, produced and wrote that song. Uh, but Huey was like, oh, it wasn't really a big hit. You shouldn't, you don't feel like the need to use that. And I go, Huey, it's just such a great song. It speaks to me. We have to use it. And he goes, all right, I trust you. So they were, he was very, very gracious and gave us the creative team a lot of you know wherewithal to try and incorporate his songs wherever we thought we were going to be able to use them most effectively it's sort of a companion to, to that answer from day one huey has been emphatic that this show will only work if the book and the story are strong so i was able to sort of use that with him when he kind of pushed back even a little and say, well, it's the best for the story. And he goes, okay, go for it. So he was great. He's great. Yeah, it seems it. And you've kind of teed up my next question so perfectly, which is, do you have a favorite moment in the show where you take a song, you kind of, you know, rework the context and give it an entirely new life? Is there one song that's your favorite of all the ones that, that you pulled in and, and did something new with? doing it all for my baby. I am a dad, I have two little kids and I have a three-year-old daughter. And that's a song that I sing to her. And I don't wanna to give too much away, but that helped sort of inspire the way we use it in the show, which of course is not the intention of the 
release of the you know the single was not, it wasn't meant in that same way and that's something we tried to do as you sort of know with with all the songs if there's the if you're expecting it in a certain way we're going to try to give it some kind of top spin or else it's 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 dull <laughs> you know yeah no question um and i do want to give a spoiler tag here because we we're going to yeah. talk about a bunch of songs and we don't want to give a lot away about the plot but we'll we'll reveal some details so if you haven't seen the show yet pause now go buy your tickets and see it and then remember to come back so we can you know dive into some detail um and we'll just talk you know maybe less about like how the songs are used but one of the kind of interesting threads of the show because it it's as i said it's a really joyous it's so much fun but it also has some real heart i mean the two main characters bobby and cassandra you know have some you know challenges to overcome in their personal lives their family history um i wanted to ask you about the inspiration of weaving that into the book and how much, like, what is it about the characters when you were writing them that really draws them to each other? And how much of that kind of past and their family kind of um, challenges really, you know, makes them feel connected? Well, I lost my dad when I was four. And so obviously that's probably the defining event of my life. Certainly the formation of me as a, as a person. And so... I wanted to explore that and using that as a basis, as I get older, my friends lose their parents. I mean, it's the cycle of life, right? And so I felt like that is a way to, to, to bond two people who on the face of things couldn't be more different, but to have that sort of shared loss and bonding over it is what gives them a connection beyond you know, Danny and Sandy or whatever the comparison is, that, you know, feels the most obvious. And I think that that's something that I really wanted to instill into the story and maintain throughout and make it feel like, yeah, this is about when these two people come together, they, they really do have an understanding of who each other are. And when Cassandra sings, he speaks right to me, sees right through me and hit me like a hammer. She's referring to that notion of this is a guy who understands my pain and my loss because he's been through it himself. Yeah, that's that's a great moment. And it's coupled so well with, you mentioned earlier, the only one which um, I found so moving, especially the way it's performed. Um, how much was that integral to your kind of conceptualizing of what the entire arc of the show would be? Because once you, you know, we're kind of learning bits and pieces about Bobby's, you know, backstory. Mm -hmm. And then when we get to that scene, you know, it all kind of locks into place in such a great way. How how important when you were outlining it was that song in that moment to the whole arc? It's vital. That song is the proverbial 11 o'clock number. And if it doesn't work, the show doesn't work. And if it does work, I think by extension, the show works. Uh, you know, setting this in the 80s, I wanted to pay homage. I love the 80s. I'm a child of the 80s. And so if you think of a movie, for example, pretty much anything Tom Cruise was in, but like Top Gun as a, as a for instance. And the sort of, you know, proverbial 11 o'clock of that movie, he goes to Tom Skerritt, he's got his own daddy issues and that's why he flies the way he does. And he learns the truth about his dad, that his dad wasn't like a turncoat, but he was actually a war hero. And that allows Tom Cruise, Maverick, to make a tough choice about what he's gonna do with regards to his future. And I was like, that is a, great paradigm because I think Bobby Stivick is very much like a Tom Cruise kind of character like his he's charming he's an underdog and his sort of flaw if you will is that he's just like too ambitious you know but in like a loving way and so I, that was sort of my guidepost of like okay if we can capture the vibe and the feel of like what I felt as a kid watching Top Gun and that sort of seminal moment that's what I want to aim for and you know hopefully we do. Oh, absolutely. Um, I also love the way you used, you mentioned, obviously, the title of the show uh, and the title song, The Heart of Rock and Roll, earlier. And I love the way that that song and I Want a New Drug are used, you know, to talk about Bobby's relationship to music. And they're really temptation songs. I mean, obviously, I Want a New Drug has it built in, but I love the way you use Heart of Rock and Roll in the show. Um, what do you think is that? I mean, what is your connection to music? Obviously, you're in entertainment industry. And what is the kind of allure of music to Bobby? Because it seems to be something I feel like a lot of people who 
you know, are in music or in a creative field, there's always that pull, right? The, the kind of push and pull of the show. Um, what is the allure, do you think, to Bobby um, of music, that continuing kind of temptation? I, Bobby is a guy who likes to spread joy. We see that in the opening number in Hip to Be Square, he buys Walkmen or gets them rather for the factory floor where he works at Stone Incorporated. And everybody is so excited by it. And I think that he's a guy that just loves to spread joy. And music is certainly a way to do that. And so I think that that, you know, coupled with the fact that his father was a musician and he didn't really know his father all that well. So he's trying to connect with his dad. But also there's just this thing in him. The heart of rock and roll is about spreading joy. And that's something you can do by performing music, by writing music, or as Mr. Stone says when he receives his Lifetime Achievement Award at the great, or I guess it's called the Chicago, the Midwest Packaging Convention, we changed it. But he talks about how being on a, in a company, working alongside people he respects, building something he's proud of, that's a way to sort of create joy as well. And so that's something that I think is important uh, is a, a message for audience members to take is that just because you know, you're know you not playing center field for the Yankees or on tour with your band doesn't mean you're not spreading joy and having an impact on the people around you. One of my favorite characters in the book and in the show is Roz. I feel like she has, I mean, some of the lines that you've written for her um, absolutely kill the audience. They, yeah. you know, Everybody loves the character. She's hysterically funny. Um, what was the inspiration for Roz? Obviously, she plays an important role in, in the narrative, too, especially for Bobby. But just such a, a scene stealer, um, what, what was the idea behind that character? And, and how, how joyful has it been for you to see her come to life? Well, first and foremost, credit where it's due. Tamika Lawrence is an absolute revelation in the part. So I can only take so much credit for it. She's unbelievable. But I would liken it to one of my favorite movies is My Best Friend's Wedding. Not in the 80s, but still. And Rupert Everett was so the scene stealer of that movie. He was the smartest person in that movie. He was the wisest. He was the funniest. And so I was like, okay. In a sort of story that takes place in this, in a similar, in Chicago, as that movie did, and um, over like a three day weekend, that's a wedding. We have a shipping conference, but it's like, who is this sort of sage that's gonna kind of be the audience proxy and kind of comment on some of the absurdity of the things that are going on and give um, you know, that sort of sound advice to our various characters, not just to Bobby, but to Cassandra as well, when she's sort of reaching her own kind of crisis point. And so that was the initial inspiration for it, but, to me, I wanted, I loved the character so much. I didn't want her to just be there in service of the other characters. I wanted her to have her own arc and her own win. And so that pushed me to kind of develop a little bit of her backstory that led to where the story kind of goes in the end. And I think it feels very satisfying when the character that people seem to be enjoying maybe the most or very much uh, is able to succeed on her own terms and not just be a bystander in this story that's technically not about her, but it is. Yeah, um, we won't say where she goes, but it, it's <laughs> it's surprising and it's fun. And, you know, as you said, it it really is a culmination of a great kind of character arc for one of the, you know, um, one of the other characters in the show other than our, our main pair. Um, I want to ask you too about our kind of antagonist in the show, if we can we can call him yeah. that kind of ex-boyfriend um, corporate villain, which I think is such a fun, you know, part and such a clever, you know, character, especially where you take him in the second act. Because I think as much as you know that he's kind of jilted, um, I don't think anybody really sees exactly how far he's going to, you know, take his kind of machinations, which is just so fun. So what was the inspiration for that character? And how much did you want to, you know, kind of use maybe a character trope that we know this kind of character, but imbue him with, you know, unique qualities? Well, right. So we're setting the show in 1987. It's a love letter to the 80s, to John Hughes. So Tucker, the character, is very much James Spader in Pretty in Pink. And so that was the sort of operating principle of this is a guy who thinks he's better than everybody and 
maybe has a little bit of a reason to. He's handsome. He's successful. He's worldly, as you know. We describe him on you know in in the context of the of the story, um, but wanting to give him humanity at least up top, right? And and try to to make him someone who is being sincere for the most part, and that he loves Cassandra, and he is sad that they parted ways. It wasn't his fault. He, but he wants her back and he's willing to do what it takes to get her back, almost making him the hero of his own story, just like any sort of romantic lead would be in a romance. And that said, once he is rebuffed, then that's when he reverts to the worst impulses in himself and become, that's his heel turn. And so I think it's, it's a, it's a fun arc and hopefully it's played. And I believe it is because Billy Ty, who plays Tucker once again, he's so freaking good. So when you find actors, especially like Billy, who's been with us for many years, you learn to write for them and what their strengths are. And so he was able to give Tucker that he didn't come off like a villain right away. You didn't trust him for sure, but you're like, I kind of do. Is the thing he's saying about Cassandra's mom at college graduation true or is he making it? I, I believe it's true. And I believe Billy's playing it like it's true. The audience may be split on whether it's true, but that to me is the magic trick of it. If, you know, if you're just convinced that this guy's full of it from the get-go, it just doesn't feel, there's no rooting interest in it whatsoever. We're too ahead of the story. Yeah, that's a great line that you pulled out because it really is, you know, it's never answered and it's it's such a um, litmus test kind of for how you read the character. Um, before I let you go, Jonathan, I do want to yeah. ask you, um, this is your Broadway debut. Um, yeah. How does it feel to, you know, to come to Broadway with this particular show, this particular book? Um, and just, as you said, the mission of the show and the song to spread joy, you know, how exciting is it for you to make your debut with this show? It's the most exciting thing and the most challenging thing I've ever done professionally. And to an extent, personally, just because I'm separated from my family going on three, almost four months now, as my wife is quick to remind me, um, on our honeymoon, on the flight, I worked the entire time doing a draft. On our one year anniversary, I was holed up in our hotel room, rewriting the script. Um, our, when our son was born, that's when we had uh, our out-of-town tryout at the Old Globe in San Diego. So this show has very much been in sync with like major life moments. And so that makes it very special personally to me. But just to be able to, with the support of our creative team and our producers and our um, you know amazing company, realize this show and actually bring it to a stage is just overwhelming. And the gratitude I feel can, can barely be expressed, but I'm just really thrilled because I've seen it now 15 times with an audience and people seem to enjoy it. And when they, when they laugh, that makes me, there's pride in that. But the thing that I really appreciate is when they're reacting emotionally to Tucker's heel turn, ooh, you know, or to a romantic moment, ooh, you know? And it's like those things where I'm like, oh, they're in it, they're in it. And that that's just such a, I can't think of a, a greater thrill creatively than seeing that, experiencing that in the moment. Jonathan Abrams, congratulations on the heart of rock and roll. Thank you so much for talking to Gold Derby today. David, thank you so much. 